Hello, everyone, and welcome to INT 111, or Programming Logic and Design. This is an introdu introductory to Python, an introductory to programming. Um, and the language that we use is Python, and we'll also use a flowchart called Raptor to basically do a design uh, on, on, on programming. Now, this is the announcement section of the course. Uh, if there are any announcements, I'll be posting it here. And here we will have um, any updates in the course, you will see it here. Now, for this course, there are two programs that you will use. One is called um, Raptor, which is the flowchart. And the programming language we will use is Python. Now, sololearn.com is where you will find a, that's a, a course that's supplement to this class. And this is the website called sololearn.com. Now, this website, you will pick the Python course, and you will be able to log in using your Google or Facebook account. Now, as you're going through this Python website or this Solo Learn website, and through this Python course, it's basically an interactive website where it will explain what Python is, and then you will uh, it will ask you a question, you will answer. There are quizzes involved. It's broken down into um, modules and concepts. Now, these modules and concepts are the ones that we will be going over uh, throughout the course. Now, within also this uh, Python website or Solo Learn website, um, we also this website also has what's called a code playground. When you assign a project that is uh, that you have to do it in Python, you have two websites to go to. You can either go to this Solo Learn website and code playground, and click on new code. Now, if you click on new code, here there is a drop down, and in this drop down, you will pick Python, and you will start typing uh, the code here. Now, the other website to use that I explained here in the announcement is called Preble. It is, again, another IDE for the project, which is right here. Okay, So the, the two links you have it in the announcement, both of them we will be able to use uh, to submit your projects, especially starting from project four all the way to seven. Now, in the announcement section, I also give you the link to the textbook. You don't have to buy a book for this course. Uh, so I put the link in here as well as under the course content. Now, if you click on the link, it will open um, uh, this page, which is basically the book itself that you can access uh, each unit that you're looking into. Uh, within the announcement, I ask a few questions that you should look at before you start uh, the class. Now, on the left side, you also have this on the blackboard. You also have what's called the start here. Now, when you click on the start here, it will explain the general stuff about the course, the announcement, basically what I'm explaining to you, and some success tips, and also the Raptor file and how to download it. Uh, below that, you will see the syllabus and the schedule link. Now, in this syllabus and schedule link, among others, you'll find links on support services for the students, academic calendar, the free fund policy, and then the syllabus and the schedule of the course. Now, you have the syllabus, which is right here, which explains about the course, which you should read, the course description, uh, my contact uh, information, and um, and um, again, the syllabus, uh, the materials that you need for the course, the attendance, some policies uh, about the course. Again, the, um, there will be a syllabus quiz, so make sure you go through this and, and read about it. Then you will also have what's called uh, the class schedule. Uh, and this class schedule gives you an idea of the assignments that you have to submit for each week and what to do. Uh, going back on the left side, we also have uh, what's called course content. If you click on course content, you will have an explanation here uh, about the course flow, Okay, the projects you have, when you have to submit them, uh, the projects you have to use, uh, Raptor. Uh, Raptor is basically a flowchart. Um, I give you the link in the announcement uh, way to download. Um, on your computers, you also have the Raptor program. This is how Raptor 
uh, looks like, basically. It's on your desktop as well. Um, so the first few projects, you'll do it in uh, two to four, you'll do it in uh, Raptor, and then projects five to seven, you'll use Python. Uh, and the first project, it's just using uh, Microsoft Word, basically explaining what the project will be about and then what you're about to do for the first assignment. Um, below that, you have what's called a discussion board. Uh, this is, you have an introduction where you will introduce yourself, uh, any programming experience, how long you have been going here, and then you also have to uh, respond to two of your classmates. There's FAQ section where you can post a question uh, to your instructor or uh, uh, to your classmates. Uh, below that, you will see the faculty info, uh, some information about me and how you can uh, contact me. Uh, below that, um, uh, you will see uh, some quick links. Some of these quick links, uh, like migrate, sending email to your classmate if you have been assigned to work with a classmate to present, then uh, you'll find it here. The same two links, I posted here on the left side, migrate and send an email. Uh, then you also have another link for library resources. Um, so that is how the course is set up and how you access the materials that you need. In the announcements, I also posted a link, uh, a quick link that explains uh, about Raptor, uh, which is a video uh, and shows uh, a small um, program. Now, the same video, I also, if you go to course content, I also put um, additional student resources and if you click on that that video you will find it here Raptor YouTube videos now if you click on this link that says Raptor YouTube videos you will see view videos that you will need about arrays about animation about subcharts um, and loops selections and graphics and so forth okay so look into that when you get a chance okay Any questions so far? No? All right. Now let's continue. So if you go to course content, and you go to units where you'll find all the work for a unit, here you have the project, the programming project, and the rubric. And then here, the course is broken down into units, unit one all the way to unit 11. Before you click on each unit, uh, you will have an idea of what is in that unit. So in this unit, you will have introduction to computers and programming concept. It will say read chapters one and two of the book. And then you have a syllabus quick, a quiz, assuming that you've read the quiz. And then you also have a unit quiz that is about um, uh, the first chapter of the course. Okay. And then you have the second unit, uh, we'll say input processing output, uh, and then you need two quiz, and then you have your project one assigned. And then within there, you also have to submit a screenshot of the basic concepts of the Python screenshot. Meaning that if you come to uh, the Python course, uh, let's go back one screen. Um, remember earlier I showed you what you had here. So this is the first part, the basic concepts. So once you complete this up to here, uh, it will give you, you will finish it, and then you will get a blue on the screenshot. You will take a screenshot of that that you have completed, and that's the screenshot that you will submit. Okay? So if we click on here in this logic design unit, again, on the left side, you will see a table of content. Um, and uh, again, the syllabus quiz, you'll find it here, the PowerPoint unit one, and then the quiz, and so forth. All right? And then there's extra links that, uh, some extra information, like women, when women start coding. Uh, a group read that you can look at. All right. Now let's start with the basic introduction of the course. Now, this is the first chapter, and here we'll discuss uh, introduction, hardware and software, how computers store data, how program, how, how a program works, and then using Python. I will also show you um, using the Raptor as well. Introduction. Devices that are computers are what? We have smartphones, iPods, tab tablets, car navigation sy uh, system, or GPS. Um, can you think of any other device that are uh, computers that you use at home? Smart TV. Yeah? Smart TV. Smart TV. What else? 
refrigerator. Smart refrigerator. What else? Console. Huh? Console. Console, game consoles, right? What else? These days, washers and dryers, right? You can press a button, and then Amazon sends you uh, detergent and so forth, right? Microwave. So computers can be programmed, designed to do any job that a programmer tells them to do. They are as smart as the program that's programming them. And a program is what? A set of instructions that a computer follows to perform a task, commonly referred to as a software. Okay. A programmer or a developer is a person who can design, create, and test a computer programs, also known as a software developer. Okay. Then we have what's called hardware and software. So hardware is basically what you can touch, and the software is what you cannot touch. So a computer system consists of central processing unit, or the CPU. Uh, and then you have what's called the main memory. Um, so this is basically the CPU, the main memory. And then you have secondary storage. Uh, you have input devices, right? And then you have the output devices, OK? What is central processing unit, or the CPU? Some authors refer this to as what's called the brain of the computer. Or you can think of it as what's called the butler of the house. Okay, think of it a house, if the computer was a house. Or well, think of the butler. What do the butler do? It will run back and forth, do all the work, right? So it's the one that goes to the main memory, gets some information from the keyboard, from the, you understand? So uh, think of it as the butler. And the main memory, think of it as when you come to the house, something you quickly need and you use it. So think of it as the closer. So the RAM, the RAM or the main memory is basically the closet, that you need something quickly, you use it. But if you need to store that uh, you know, in the long term, that would be what? In the secondary storage. So you go to the basement and store it in there. Does that make sense? Then you have the input devices. Um, these are things that it will take from the user, okay? either from the mic, from the keyboard, okay? and then puts it in, in the computer. So the output would be whatever it gets from the input. For example, if the input is the mic, Okay, the output would be what? Speaker. The speaker. If the input is the keyboard, the output be what? The screen, the monitor, or the projector, whatever it may be, right? And so forth. All right? Any question on that? So the hardware basically is, like we said, is the physical devices that make up a computer. So a computer is a system composed of several components that all work together. So typical major components are the central processing unit, the main memory, secondary storage, input and output devices, as we just mentioned. So the CPU is the part of the computer that actually runs programs. Most important component, uh, without it, cannot run software, and it's used to be, uh, used to be a, a, a huge device. So in the past, uh, it was almost six, seven feet tall and almost a uh, few hundred feet all right just and uh, and it wasn't as it couldn't it wasn't as powerful as what we have right now which is basically as small as your thumb so microprocessors or cpus located on the small chips now so look at the screen here so the one on the top uh, right hand corner uh, this was the cpu back in the days and now here is the cpu see how small that is and the main memory is where computer stores a program while program is running and data used by the program. So this is known as random access memory or a RAM, okay? This, the RAM is basically very volatile, meaning that if you shut off the computer, everything will go away. While the secondary storage keeps it, even if you turn off the computer, if the computer goes bad, the hardware is still good, you can still access that information. CPU is able to quickly access data in the RAM. Uh, volatile memory used for temporary storage while program is running. So contents are erased when the computer is off, erased from the memory, okay? We have hardware and software. So the ROM we have, instead of RAM, we also have what's called ROM, read-only memory, okay? So a computer can read the contents of a ROM, but it cannot change its contents or store additional data there. ROM is non-volatile. So it does not lose its contents even when the computer's power is turned off. ROM is typically used to store programs that are important for the system's operation. For example, the computer startup programs, which is executed each time the computer started. Things like BIOS, right? Okay. Then we have the secondary storage, 
it can hold data for a long period of time. Okay, programs normally so uh, here and load it to main memory when needed. And then here it talks about some of the types of secondary uh, memory. So you have disk drives, uh, solid state drive, flash memory, and then optical devices. So disk drive or magnetic encoded data onto a spinning circular disk and the solid state or SSD is faster than disk drives. Think of these two as driving uh, um, non-electric car. When you're standing right next to them, you hear sounds right of the engine. So that's the normal disk drive. But the solid state of SSD, think of an electric car. If you're standing next to them, do you hear any sound? No. Now, if you think about your laptops, if you have one that uses a regular disk uh, hard drive, you will hear the sound as you start that computer or that laptop. But the ones they use, like macro, like the SSD, you don't hear anything. That's how you know the, the type of hard drive that you have on your computer. And then we have secondary storage devices, uh, which is the cloud storage. Okay. So when you store data in the cloud, you're storing it on a remote server via the internet or via company private network. You can access it from any, uh, many different devices and from any location where you have a network connection. If you don't have internet connection, you cannot access it. You can also use it to back up important data that's stored on a computer disk. So what are some examples you can think of that are cloud storage? Google Drive is an example. What else? Uh, iCloud. Okay, what else? Huh? One drive. Okay. What else? Do we have two drive? We don't have two drive, right? Okay. What else? You heard of S3? Okay. AWS or Amazon Web Services have similar one, and it's called S3. Okay. That is also another cloud storage. So we, we discuss about input devices, all right? Data the computer collects from people and other devices, and then we, components that collect basically the data. So keyboard, mouse, touchscreen, scanner, camera. Disk drives can be considered input devices because they load programs into the main memory. And output devices, so data produced by the computer for other people or devices. It can be text, image, audio, or bit stream. Um, so here you have some examples. Software. What is a software? So everything the computer does is controlled by software. So you have some general categories. You have application software, and you have a system software. So application software is programs that make a computer useful for everyday tasks, like word processing, email, games, and web browsers. Are there any other application software that you can think of? Calculator, okay. Calculator on, on your computer or on your, what else? Email. All the office suite. What else? Browsers. How about in Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook? They are applications. It's just shortcut that you're saying apps. Apps means applications, right? I hope you know that by now. <laughs> All right. And then we have what's called a system software. So these are programs that control and manage basic operations of a computer. And there are three types of this. You have the operating system, you have the utility programs, and you have software development tools, like the IDEs. Remember, I talked about Python being an online IDE, those two websites. Those are an example of IDEs, but they are online. That's an example of software development tool. Okay. So any example that you know, any operating systems? Like Windows. 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 What else? Huh? Mac OS. Okay. Android. Android. What else? The company? Huh? 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 So what would be the operating system then? Yeah. Nope. That would be application. 
Windows, right? What else do you say? Linux. Okay, so you mentioned Windows, you mentioned Linux, you mentioned uh, Mac OS, you mentioned Android. IBM. Huh? IBM. IBM, what is IBM? I forget. All right. <laughs> if you say uh, Mac OS or if you say Android, you know they just took Linux and modified it. Because the commands you run in Mac OS or you run on Android is the same as the ones you run on, on Linux. Linux and open source. Apple and Google just took this Linux operating system, modified it, made it their own, and they're selling it. All right. And then we'll talk about what's called how computers store data. So a computer memory is divided into tiny uh, storage locations known as bytes. So one byte represents one number, and a byte is divided into smaller storage locations known as bits. Does that make sense? So a way to remember if a snake bits you, let's hope it doesn't bit you. Eight times, one, two, three, four, four, all the way to eight. Small bits become what? Huge byte. All right. So that's basically it. All right. So a byte is divided into eight smaller storage locations known as bits or binary digits. So bits are tiny electrical components that can hold either a positive or a negative charge. So a positive charge is similar to a switch in the on position, a negative charge is similar to the off position. Um, are you guys familiar with uh, how binary numbers work? Have you guys covered that in 1010 or no? Okay, let me show you how it works. Uh, let me start a paint. So remember how many bits that will make a byte? Eight. Eight. So let's say we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this would be a byte, right? Let me add a T in there. All right. So it uses base two. Binary numbers uses base two. So this one would be two to the power zero. This would be two to the power one. This would be two to the power two. This would be two to the power three. This would be 2 to the power 4. This would be 2 to the power 5. This would be 2 to the power 6. And this would be 2 to the power 7. 2 to the power 0 is what? 1. 2 to the power 1 is? 2. 2 to the power 2 is? 4. 2 to the power 3 is? The next one would be? Next one would be? Next one would be? And the next one would be? There you go. Now the next one would be what? If it was, if we had two to the eight. Huh? 256, the next one would be? Huh? 512, the next one would be? 1024, what's 1024? One kilobyte, right? Now, if it was 10 to 20, the next one would be, after one kilobyte, it would be what? One megabyte. After one megabyte, it would be one gigabyte, and so forth. Okay? So this is basically uh, how binary numbers work. Um, so uh, can anybody tell me their age, maybe? <laughs> uh, or, or some number, give me a number, and then tell me in binary numbers to see that you understand? One. Huh? One. Zero, 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 one. <laughs> zero, 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 one would be what, then? No. One is a two to the zero. It's the first one. It's a one, and then everything else is zero. Remember, you start from right, and you go left. Okay? Tell me a number first, and then tell me the binary numbers for that. Hmm? You said four? Okay, so you want to give me four? Okay, so what would be the binary number for that? Remember, we start from the right. So zero, zero, one, you said? Okay, and then? Zero, zero, one, and then? Everything else is zero? Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, so this will be two to the zero, two to the one. So this would be what? Two to the two. So all we have here now is what? Four. Does that make sense? So any question on binary numbers? 
Okay, so that's what this is basically talking about here. All right. Storing numbers, bits represent two values, zero and one. So computers use by the num uh, numbering system. So position of a digit J is assigned the value of two to the J minus one. And that's what we were talking about earlier. So to, de to determine values of binary numbers, some position values of the ones. Remember, the 128, the 64, the 32, you add all those, okay? So byte size limits are zero and all the way to 255. Zero equals all bits of 255, all bits on. So to store a larger number, use several uh, bytes. So how do computers store data? So storing numbers, so the positive charge or the on positions represents by the digit one and the off is zero, okay? And here's an example of what we were just talking about. Okay, you can go back to this slide later on, on slide 18. Okay, some more examples of how the numbers are read and how you can calculate. Storing char characters, so data stored in a computer must be stored as a binary numbers. So characters are converted into numeric code, uh, numeric code stored in memory. So most important coding scheme is ASCII. ASCII is limited, so defines code for only 128 characters. Unicode, <coughs> Unicoding scheme become a standard and compatible with ASCII can represent characters for other languages. Okay, so storing characters again. So ASCII, American Standard Code for Information Interchange is a coding scheme. Now we talked about the numbers in, in terms of the letters, uh, capital A would be 65, Capital B would be what? 66, capital C would be 67 and so forth, okay? It's different from the small case. If it was a small a, it would be what? It starts at 97, okay, small b would be 98, and then it goes from there, okay? So storing ASCII characters is a set of 128 numeric codes. ASCII is limited. Uh, Unicode is an extensive encoding scheme. It's compatible with ASCII. It represents characters for many languages in the world. Okay, so Unicode, an example of that would be the Chinese, the Arabic, the, Hin the Hindu, the Amharic, and so forth. Okay. Advanced number storage. So to store negative number and real numbers, computers use binary numbering and encoding schemes. So negative numbers encoded using two complements, so real numbers encoded using floating point uh, notation. And then we talk about other types of uh, data. Digital uh, uh, describes any device that stores data as binary numbers. Digital images, digital music. Okay. How does a uh, program work? So CPU designed to perform simple operations on pieces of data. Reading data, adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing numbers, okay? understanding instructions within machine language, and included in its instructions. Each brand of CPU has its own instruction set. So to carry out meaningful calculation, CPU must perform many operations. A program must be copied from a secondary memory to a RAM each time a CPU executes it. CPU executes program in a cycle. Okay, it fetches, it decodes, and it executes. Okay, so this is how it looks like. From machine language to assembly language, computers only understand machine language. Machine language is difficult to write. Okay, assembly language uses short words that are known as mnemonic, mnemonics. You have assemblers used to translate an assembly language program uh, to a machine language. We have high level languages and we have low level languages. So high level languages, uh, what, we, what we call object oriented programming languages. Um, it allows you to create powerful and complex programs without knowing how the CPU works. Some examples of that are Java, C++, C Sharp, Python, Visual Basic, uh, the Fortran. Is there any other language you can think of that is a high-level language? You heard of Objective-C? Heard of Swift? No? But you all have Apple iPhones. <laughs> okay, so the language that's used to develop those apps, it's, uh, it used to be Objective-C, you can still use it. Uh, another example of that is the Swift, that's the one that you currently use, okay? PHP is not listed here, that's also another uh, high-level language. What would be a low-level language? HTML would be an example of 
a low level language. JavaScript would be another example of a low level language. Okay. So languages use keywords, operators, and syntax. Um, so keywords is predefined words used to write program in a high level language. Um, each word has specific meaning. We have operators perform operations on data. Example, math operators perform like plus, minus, multiplication, division, and so forth. Syntax is a set of rules to be followed when writing a program. The same way you would follow rules when you talk about the, uh, any language, whether it's English or not. Statements are individual instruction used in high-level language. Um, besides Python, the other high-level languages use a semicolon to end a statement. You can have two lines. That doesn't mean the statement have ended until you write a semicolon. In Python, it considers the next line to be its, each line to be its own line. So if you write, if you have a statement and you put in two different lines, that's considered two different statements. We have what's called compilers and interpreters. Uh, these are basically the IDEs that you use have uh, built in. So programs written in a high-level language must be translated into a machine language to be executed. A compiler translates high-level language programs into separate machine language programs. Okay, so machine language programs can be executed at any time. Again, when you're using these online IDEs, they are doing that in the background. Okay, they're built in. Same thing with interpreter, translates and executes instruction in a high-level language program used by Python language or other, other high-level languages. Interprets one instruction at a time and no separate machine language uh, uh, program. You have the source code, statements written by the programmer. So the statements that you type as you're typing uh, the code in... Uh, in any of these IDEs, that is basically the source code. You have syntax error prevents the code from being translated. So this is the steps that involved uh, a high-level programming language. Okay, you say print hello, and then the interpreter takes that and then translates into a machine language, and then the machine language, uh, uh, the zeros and ones, that's what the CPU is given to, and then it puts out the output. So. You have two choices. Uh, you can install Python on your computer, or uh, you use the two online IDEs that I have given you. Okay. So you have the interactive mode, uh, or not, indicates the interpreter is waiting for a Python statement to be typed. Remember, I told you to use the rebel it. So that one you can interact. But if you use the other one, the solo learn uh, code playground, there is no interactivity. Everything you have to put in one time. Okay, let's see. Writing Python programs and running them in a script mode. So statements can be entered in interactive mode and not saved as a program. To have a program use script mode, save the, uh, a set of Python statements in a file. The file name should be the .py. And if you look at the, uh, the Rebel-It website, uh, it shows you the first time you try to create a file, automatically it will add the .py, okay? So to run the file, the script, you type the Python and then the file name at the beginning of the command line. And let's look at um, uh, some of these IDEs. So we can go to um, the solo learn here. And then if you want to print something in Python, we just say print. Let me make this bigger so you can see it. So if I say print, and then I say, hello world, okay? And then you click on run here. The IDT detects that, it translates it automatically. It went through the, uh, it, it interpreted, converts it to machine language, zeros and ones, the CPU text that, and then it gives us the output, hello world. Everything happened in the back end. The same code we can take and then run it in Rebel, and then paste it there, and then print it. Say, say, hello world. Now, I want to show you the difference. Now here, hello world, or uh, now if we type um, a name, we'll discuss this in chapter two. Um, so if we say name here, I'm declaring a variable, and then I will say, input basically i want to get something from the user and then i'll put a quotation in here with parentheses i will say what is your name right and then here i can print and then say 
your name is add plus sign here and type name basically i'm saying uh, to print something in python you say print what is inside the quotation is called a string when i say name this is a variable input means i'm expecting something from the user now when the user types the information i want to print that to the output i'll say print your name is this is a string anything inside the quotation is considered to be a string by saying plus and then name i'm saying print whatever this person have, have typed in. So I will say run. Here, again, this ID is different. So here I will say, let's say if I say Mohammed, and then press submit. Say hello world, what's your name? Your name is Mohammed. You see that? Now, if I was to ask another question, okay, it will put everything it will ask all the questions, that it expects all the questions at one time. So here, if I say uh, input, uh, give me another question. How old are you? Okay. So here, I, again, like I defined a name there, I need to define, give it a variable. So I will say age, and then say that. Now, for me to print that, I will say print, you are, and then here I will say what? H, I grab that variable, okay? And then I can say plus, and then add, the plus I means concatenating for me. So now when I run it, Mohammed, the next answer, I have to put it right below it, all the answers. Hey, this is in solo log. 89. How old am I? See what happens here? I have to enter all the questions, what? At the same time. Your name is, how old are you? You are, do you understand? Mm -hmm. Now let's take the same code and paste it here and run it. Okay. Watch what happens. Hello world, right? What is your name? So it's asking me the question, Mohammed. See that? It says your name is Mohammed. Now it's asking what? The age instead of putting all of them at the same time. All right? 40, you are 40. I forgot to say years old. So here you can say years old. Does that make sense? You see that? So if you do a REPL, it's very interactive. Does that make sense? But if you do it in solo learn, it expects that you put in all the answers at the same time. Now, again, we'll discuss this as we move on uh, in the next chapter. So, uh, so basically, this is the basics of Python. It's very forgiving. Uh, when you type, it's very loose, uh, high-level language. While other languages, it requires that you put in uh, semicolons and, and write it in blocks and so forth. All right. So when I say hello world here, what's your name? It automatically assumes that I'm putting in another line in. How old are you? Uh, and then when I ask, uh, what's your name? And then I'm typing Muhammad here. You can put in here and say slash N to say I need a new line when you write the name. And then here you are, when it says how old are you? And I put the number in here, you can actually make it go to another line like that, putting a new line in. And when I run it, right, say, what's your name? Mohammed. See that? Your name is Mohammed. Put in another line. How old are you? I put the 40 in, and then it will say, see that? Okay. Now, so this is very interactive. While this one expects you to put it in uh, all at the same time. You can use both of them. It's not a problem. Uh, but the essential part that you have to do in this website is to go through this. Again, everything we're doing, it kind of uh, uh, is explained here as you go on. Uh, what I did when I say name equals or age equals, that's called variables. A string is what I put inside the quotation. All these are explained in there. So it's very important that you start this ahead of time and you work uh, your way through. Now, Raptor, uh, there is a video that I put in there for you, uses a uh, similar method, but it shows you the design uh, of the concept. Okay, so it's a flow chart. 
So if you want to just print something, you can just drag this. This is called output, the print that I did, and this is called input. This is when I was asking a question. So for example, if you say output, I can drag this right here and put it right here. It says, oh, you have to save it first. So first save, give it a save, and then give it a name. So it's say test, and then I'll just save it on the desktop. Okay, now it's saved. Now it says output, right? So this is output, this is input. So if I double click on this, and I just type hello world, and I run it, this is the run button. I put hello world in quotation, I say run. So it runs it, it says hello world, you see that? Now the same thing if I ask, I'm asking the question, so you use input. So you drag this one right here, and we double click on it, and we'll say, what is your name? Like that, and then you assign a variable. It's kind of backwards. So the same name, we, the same way we assign a variable, we will say here what? Name. Okay. But if you want to print that name out, remember we're getting input. If you want to print that out, we will say what? We need an output. So when we click on the output, we will say, "Your name is." I can say plus the name, like the name that I type. Now, when we run, it will, it will go through hello world and say, what is your name? So if I say Mohammed, it will go through it and say, your name is Mohammed. You see that? So the flow chart shows you how you interact, right? How you drag. It's an input, an output, and the order matters. Can I ask you what's my name if I never told you my name? No. So here, I have to, after I said, what's your name, I use the variable what? name so I can use that variable name here. The variable must match uh, what it's trying to convey, meaning. So here I said name and I'm expecting a name. When I said age, I'm expecting an age. I can call here banana. There's nothing wrong with that. And then when I print, I have to make sure that I use what? Banana. But the only difference is that if somebody else comes after you, okay, I'm saying my name is Mohammed. Uh, hold are you if I say 40 it will still give me a 40 years old but the variable description don't match the name that I'm you understand mm -hmm. so make sure the variables that you pick is descriptive enough of what you use okay so I do have a video uh, about that explains the Raptor that I put in in the um, in the announcement as we saw it here all right so if you go to and the announcement there's that similar video that explains that, which I expect you to watch it um, as well. So any questions so far? Again, this video will be available for you to see it later in case that, uh, that you want to see things that we did today in class.